This is going to be an overview of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's name means Jehovah is my helper. Isaiah is a hellfire preacher that preached warning the southern kingdom of their future doom. He preached before the captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah, but he knew about the captivity of the northern kingdom. Isaiah preached during the same time as prophets like Hosea, Micah, and Nahum. And I'm sure they were sharing sermon outlines with each other and listen to each other on tape and poke fun at the false prophets of the devil together. But something strange about Isaiah is the Lord told him to walk around butt naked in Isaiah chapter 20. That is a strange thing. The Lord would have his men do some strange things to get the attention of the Jews because the Jews require a sign. And we don't do signs today. But they did during Isaiah's time. Isaiah married a prophetess. They had two sons. One of them has a super long name, which is extremely hard to pronounce. It's like Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And can you imagine how long it would take for him to learn how to spell that? But that was his name. Can you imagine if both of your parents were prophets? Can you imagine this kid's life? Had such a long name and then both of his parents were prophets. He probably couldn't get by with anything. But Isaiah married a prophetess. And Isaiah preached under the reign of multiple kings. And in chapters 1 through 5 of the book of Isaiah, he preached under Uzziah. In chapter 6, it was under Jotham. In chapter 7 through 12, it was under Ahaz. In chapters 13 through 66, it was under Hezekiah. So Isaiah saw a lot of different kings during his time preaching. And that's what you need to realize too is when you're reading, you know, the the books of the kings that you know, you're reading you're in the around the middle part of your Old Testament, but a lot of these prophets that's is happening around the same time. So let's do some breakdowns to the book. In chapters 1 through 12, you have sermons against Judah and Israel. A preacher who doesn't have sermons against things is most likely against God in many ways. So you have to have some sermons against things. In 13 through 23, you have burdens of judgments against other nations. It's good for men to expose the sins of entire nations and warn of their coming judgment. 24 through 27, foretell future glory of the nation of Israel. A good preacher will also tell you what awaits those who are saved and faithful. Chapters 28 through 25 show the causes of Israel's punishment. A good preacher will not only tell you what you're doing wrong, but why you're doing wrong. Why is it wrong? 36 through 39, you have historical material regarding Hezekiah. In chapters 1 through 48, you have God's call to the Jew. In 49 through 66, you have God's call to the Gentile. And this book contains 66 chapters, 1,292 verses, and 37,044 words. Something amazing about the book of Isaiah is that it is like a Bible within a Bible. It has 66 chapters to go along with the 66 books of the Bible. Something even more amazing is that you can line up the chapter of Isaiah with, like, Genesis is the first book of your Bible. So in the first chapter of Isaiah, you will have a verse that reminds you of Genesis. For example, Isaiah 1-2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So, doesn't that remind you of Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, Isaiah 1 mentions heaven and earth, while Genesis 1-1 mentions heaven and earth. And then Isaiah 39-6 says, Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. So that would match Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, the 39th book. 
in Isaiah 39. And then Isaiah 40, the voice of him crying, crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths, make straight in the desert a way, a highway for our God. So that would match the book of Matthew, the 40th book of the Bible. You have Isaiah 40 talking about the person who's going to prepare ye the way of the Lord, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is referring to John the Baptist who shows up in Matthew the 40th book of the Bible, as the forerunner for Jesus Christ. Then Isaiah 66 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, said the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So that will match the book of Revelation, the 66th book of your Bible. It talks about new heavens and a new earth. So it is an amazing book. It's This book has something that should get you excited about reading the Bible. But there are three main subjects in this book, and that is the tribulation, the second coming, and the millennium. This book isn't old news. It's talking about things that are ahead of everything on your news feed right now. This book typifies Jesus Christ as our Messiah. And this is what you'll see in this book is the Lord Jesus Christ over and over again. In John 1, it says, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And that's what the book of Isaiah typifies, is Jesus Christ as our Messiah. And the book of Isaiah has so many prophecies of Jesus Christ that many people call it the Gospel of Isaiah. So let's begin by looking at some prophecies about Jesus Christ. You'll see the virgin birth of Jesus in Isaiah. This is a foundational truth to our Bible-believing faith. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He had no earthly father. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So there you have the virgin birth prophesied in Isaiah. Next you have his incarnation. He was God born in the flesh. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So you have the deity of Jesus Christ there in Isaiah chapter 9. Then you have the Lord's forerunner, John the Baptist, is prophesied. As we talked about in Isaiah 40, in verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So the fact that Jesus came as a servant is also prophesied. In Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Next you see his lowly status in Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. So you see his lowly status, and you see the fact that he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. In Isaiah 8, 14, it says, and he shall be, a, be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Then in chapters 52 and 53, you have some of the greatest sections of the Bible about his suffering, his death, and his triumph. And that's just a very tiny sample of what you see about Jesus Christ in this book. So right off to get you excited about reading this is you have all of the prophecies about Jesus Christ. You have the fact that Isaiah, each chapter of Isaiah will line up with each book of the Bible. 66 chapters in Isaiah, 66 books in your Bible. So this is a very interesting book. Not to mention all the crazy stories that go in it and all the prophecies about the tribulation, the millennium, and the second coming. So that right there should be enough to get you interested in reading the book. 
But let's go through the first few chapters and just look at some of the great verses that are mentioned. Like Isaiah 1, 5. Why should be you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. What God is basically telling them here is, why should I whip you anymore? Why should I punish you anymore? Because they're going to take the beating and just continue to sin against him. That is a very dangerous shape to be in. If you're to the point where God is whipping you and you still continue in sin against him, then God's going to say, hey, he doesn't want to listen to me, so I'm just going to let him go through with all this and just die early. I'm going to let him die before his time because he just keeps sinning even though I'm chastening him. Then you'll go to heaven and you'll not have any rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You can be saved and, and live wickedly, but God will take you out early and you won't have any rewards. Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See, God is reasonable. He wants to reason with you. God did not want you to perish, so he died on the cross for your sins and offered the payment to you so that his blood could cleanse your sins. Then you get to chapter 2, and we see some good doctrine about the millennium in chapter 2. Isaiah 2 and verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. You see, the nations are going to come and worship Jesus Christ on a throne in Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we're going to sit under Jesus Christ as he teaches us in the millennial reign. One of my favorite things to do is hear a preacher go verse by verse through the Bible and just tell me what God has shown him. Imagine being able to hear the living word teach the written word. Isaiah 2, 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It will be complete peace when Jesus Christ is on the throne. No rioting, no looting, no sex trafficking, no drugs, no alcohol that will make people rob and kill and rape. All this stuff is going to be done away with. The Bible gives you something to look forward to and then it will re rebuke you in the same chapter. It says in Isaiah 2.8, Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. So you have most likely at one point had an idol in your life. If you're spending more time with anything other than God, it can become an idol and you're just worshiping the work of men's hands. Isaiah 2, 9 through 12. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Enter into for. Enter into the rock, and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. So this, this goes into talking about the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord of hosts... And then notice it says, in that day. In that day, the mighty men are going to go hide in the holes and rocks of the mountains. All of these big, tough guys you see in this world are nothing compared to God. Notice those phrases, in that day, in day of the Lord. When you see those phrases, it's talking about something in the future. And you see, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I believe that the day of the Lord is primarily talking about the second coming, but it also covers other end times events in your Bible. For example, the tribulation, the second coming, and the millennium. You'll see that phrase used when it's talking about these events. 
Isaiah 2, 19, And they shall go up into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So it's like Jesus Christ is going to grab the earth and shake it like you would a snow globe. And imagine the line of the tribe of Judah busting through the clouds and seeing Jesus coming back in fury and anger. Isaiah 2.20, In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to be moles or to the moles and to the bats. Because what can that stuff do for them against Jesus Christ and his army? Absolutely nothing. All these idols you got, they can't save you in the day of your tribulation. Isaiah 2.21, To go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Isaiah 3, 4, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. So kids are ruling over people today. The sign of the last days is children being disobedient to parents, as Paul tells us. And the devil wants everything out of order. He wants the children above the parents, and he wants the women above the men. Everything is as backwards as the devil can get it. Isaiah 3, 5, And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. So kids shouldn't act like they know more than their parents. Even though there are cases when they do, this is just backwards to how the Lord wants it. He wants order. He sets up the authority. Isaiah 3.12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. As a general rule, women shouldn't rule over men. Women shouldn't even want to have a man who wants them to rule over them. It's backwards. A 40-year-old woman should not be a spiritual advisor of a older man, a 70-year-old man. That should be embarrassing for the man. The men need to be men and work and lead and learn the book so that they can teach the women. What I don't understand is you got these churches, you got a young woman as the pastor. you got a 70-year-old man, 80-year-old man in the congregation, and that's his spiritual advisor. That's pathetic. If your wife or some younger woman knows more Bible than you, you should be embarrassed, and that should encourage you to get out your Bible and make sure that they don't know more. The sad thing is, when you go to church, who are usually the most spiritual Bible students in there? It's the women. Men need to step their game up. All the, uh, all the Christians I'm, I've met, the women are knowing more than than of the Bible. And I'm not talking about in terms of preachers. I'm talking about in the people sitting in the pews. It seems to be the women that are really into the Bible and not so much the men. And men really need to get in the Bible, read it, study it, meditate on it, memorize it. I mean, you don't want to be a 60-year-old man and know nothing about the Bible. But that's the case for most Christian men. Chapter 5. Isaiah 5.11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, <coughs> that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night to wine and flame them. All through your Bible, you have warning against drinking alcohol. It kills families and relationships. It makes you not be able to hold down a job. It wipes out your money for the week. Isaiah 5.14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. As I said, Isaiah is a hellfire preacher. He's preaching on a little bit of everything. He knows there is a literal fire beneath your feet. He says in Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. This would describe 2020. They say it's okay to kill millions of babies, but it's wrong to kill an animal. They say it's okay to marry the same sex, but if you're a Christian who believes homosexuality is of the devil, 
then you're labeled a hater. They make evil look beautiful, but they make the righteous to look wicked. That is why some preachers say a real preacher is a sheep in wolf's clothing. He's a sheep, but he's so biblical that people think he's mean. But the Bible is rough, and it's against man. It's against the ways of man and the world. Isaiah 6, 2 and 3. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So Isaiah even gets into the spirit world in this book. You see these seraphims with six wings, unlike the cherubim with four wings. Wouldn't it be something to see what Isaiah saw? We're going to see it one day for ourselves. And chapter 8, verse 19, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? So run as far away from the occult stuff as you can. Because all through the Bible, God's obviously against it, and Isaiah's preaching against it. Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to his word, it is because there is no light in them. And the Bible says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. The word of God will make you full of light. When you don't walk according to the, what the Bible says, it shows a lack of Bible reading, and you just are showing that you're, you're putting darkness in. Chapter 11. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf of the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. So do you love animals? Okay, in the millennium, you can have any kind of animal you want, and it won't eat you. Verse 7 through 9. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatristan. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there you see more prophecy about the millennial reign, a very interesting time period in your Bible. And then chapter 14, verse 9, Hell from beneath is moved for thee, to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So Isaiah preaches hell hot and heavy once again. In Isaiah 6, he preached heaven sweet. And he says, hell from beneath is moved for thee. And what a picture that puts in your mind. Hell is a place down there waiting for lost sinners. Just open its mouth, opening its mouth to receive them. Then in Isaiah 14, you also have very... Uh, descriptive verses about the devil and his fall he wanted to be like god but he's also going to end up in hellfire isaiah 27 1 you have it where it talks about leviathan the piercing serpent even leviathan the crooked serpent the dragon that's in the sea and you cross-reference that was revelation 20 and verse 2 and it shows you who leviathan is Revelation 20 verse 2 says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. See how simple the Bible is? Compare scripture with scripture, you find out the identity of Leviathan is the devil. But that's just a, a quick sample of all the great verses and things that's in the book of Isaiah. This book is just loaded. You have one of the greatest Old Testament chapters on Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53. Just over and over again, you see things about the tribulation, the millennium, the second coming, the Lord Jesus Christ, and just tons of practical things you can use for your everyday life. I mean, it's 66 chapters. It's a big book. So make sure to get this book out and read it.